Karen. I'll go Karen Gannett from Crime Research Group. Thank you. Okay, it's Monica Weber from the Department of Corrections, and I told Rebecca, but I'll apologize to all of you. I have to leave by seven o'clock. So, I guess I'll go. Evan Meenan with the Department of State's Attorneys and Sheriffs. Hey, Julio. Hey. Uh, I am Wichiertu, uh, appointed by Susana Davis, and I'm a data engineer. I am Susana Davis, the Racial Equity Director for the state. I'm Elizabeth Morris. Um, I'm the Juvenile Justice Coordinator at FSD within DCF. Julio, you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Julio Thompson, Director of Civil Rights Unit at Attorney General's Office. Wonderful. And our new um, we're replacing David. Sure. Right. Uh, Should we on the panel? As a panel? Uh, Dave, Dave Sher has left our office to go to the Cannabis Control Board as general counsel. So I'm filling in that slot until uh, they replace him at, in our office. Okay. Oh, I thought it was official. So we're not yet official. Or we'll I'm officially replacing David. David has left. So. <laughs> All right. Welcome. Um, and let's see who's there mark and Ian. if you could introduce yourselves hi uh ian loris i'm uh Aton, summer assistant just going to be taking notes and reporting back to him on the meeting thank you so much so one more i think that's mark to see this mark on here. Well, Mike is not working. Sorry. Okay. Um, and uh, I guess this is recorded. So thanks for thanks for um, coming, everybody. And so Etan uh, asked that we were called that we um, were about to talk uh, about. Evan's suggestion um, last time we met, which was over, I guess it was two weeks ago, before Labor Day, right? Um, and Evan, you had submitted then sort of a, right before we met or something, where we didn't have a chance to either hear you sort of walk us through it, it's my recollection, and then discuss it. But it had something to do with relating to well, the entity itself. Right, what, where we thought um, the entities should go um, and why, and you had some model legislation perhaps. Um, and, and so Eitan hoped that we could um, hear from Evan and walk through that proposal and then discuss it. Um, he also shared with all of us tonight a document he asked me to sort of pull together and edit for him lightly formatted it really and that's what we've all been previously working on with the various charts and the mission and all of that um and he sent that out too under the title in which this is for you rdap act 65 report dot draft so that's something i pulled together and walked walked through with him and it's basing sort of the format that we used in our prior report submission to the legislature December of 2020. Um, and specifically what I did was we had an introduction section in that and and um, and so we I copied and pasted the Act 65 uh, that we're addressing and then I can walk through what's going on there and it will highlight sort of areas we've come to an agreement on areas that we started to just discuss but hadn't agreed upon and then sort of highlights the gaps and need to know. So sort of open to how we want to, which makes sense to go over first. Should we jump into Evan's suggestion or, or go over this, this report? Does anyone have any suggestions? Maybe because Julio, it's, it's Julio's first, first, um, meeting here maybe we should it makes sense to just walk through that draft report 
because it, by, by walking through it, we sort of summarize for him and remind ourselves what, um, what we did before Labor Day. <laughs> um, all right, so you, do you guys have that open? Um, and if that's, if that's fine, I'll, I'll, I'll summarize and go through it. And please jump in with any questions or suggestions um, as we do it. All right, so cover page with our, our title and members and to be to be finished. That's those are placeholder holders. So as I said, the introduction again, borrowing from our, our format of the last report, just effectively copied and pasted the actual legislation that we're here to address. And that is specifically Section 19 Act 65. Um, the section 19 is verbatim and only excludes the portion of the legislation addressing uh, funding, um, supplementing payment of, of consulting uh, con consultants that we might go to during this period, as well as um, reimbursement for time and expenses for community members on this committee and this panel for the time that they would be devoting to this project. So that is that. That's the introduction. Then I started doing Roman numerals after that, pulling from the language of back to section 19. There is little a and then it tells by November 15th or before. This report that we've been asked to do shall address and it goes through one through five things we should do. And we've been um, going through that sort of in a very free flowing way and not, and so we're putting them in as subheadings. What I did here was I, I literally copied and pasted these one through fives and turned them into Roman numerals. So we could sort of keep track and and, and figure out where this, the things we've been talking about fit into and, and where we still have room to, to address the issues we've been tasked to address. So, that gets us to page two, which is Roman numeral two, which is where um, hopefully Evan can lead, lead us into this discussion. Uh, and we were asked by the legislature to identify um, where the data entities should be situated. And um, the advantages and disadvantages of being a standalone body being how or being housed in state government. Now here a there is a there's a subheading there that says that the new data entity should be called the Office of Social Justice Statistics. Full disclosure, this is something that when Eitan asked me to incorporate the edits from our last meeting, he said that this was his idea to come up with. He was tired of um, of us not having a name. He recognized, um, and, and Julia, the legislation uh, identifies it as a bureau, but I've raised in previous discussions problems that I had with, with identifying as a bureau. We kept turning it into an entity, and Aton suggested this, um, and which I see your, your hand. Uh, if I could just finish this thought, and then I'll, 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 I'll have you talk. Yeah, yeah no problem, no problem. Um, my initial response to him, so one of the reasons he explained about picking this name was a addressing our concerns about scalability and not keeping this to be so narrowly identifiable as racial equities only, right? So that was the approach with choosing social justice. Uh, he chose office, he wasn't beholden to it. My immediate reaction to office was the office, department, agency, all of those have certain meanings uh, in terms of where they fall within the hierarchy of the executive branch um, and we can discuss that more and he also thought he wanted to know what we thought about this name as a group since this is a new introduction to this and and if we do decide on this name or any other name it will warrant sort of an explanation of why we really don't like the bureau um, and then the second part to it, which is what's being addressed is, well, where, where should it be? In state government or outside of state government? I think as a group, you can, well, oh, sorry, I'll stop there, Wuchi. 
Yeah, I just wanted to say I I really like like the idea of the social justice statistics, you know, whatever department agency, whatever we want on that side. But I think the social justice statistics allows for what we've been talking about, um, where it's just like race, but also like the intersections of race with gender, with sexuality, right? And all these things. And it allows us to envision a broader uh, Vermont data warehouse of social justice without having it be that we're trying to do everything all at once. So I, I like that we're focusing on our mission, but envisioning a, a, a broader future. Do others want to share their feelings, their, their, their reactions to that too, at this point? Seems like might as well jump into the discussion as we're going through this. Well, I, I can start. I mean, I, I like the name. I think that I want to also, well, obviously this is just the beginning and we would need to um, give a little bit more description and, and talk about the fact, I think very clearly that we, the first focus of this office needs to be uh, around racial justice because that's what the, the statute says. And I think that's what our body is, is interested in doing um, and explaining that the reason for the broader title is to allow the state to have more opportunities um, to expand it. I, I, I just would want to make sure that we're not giving people an impression that we're forgetting what the main, our main point is. Um, I don't know if that makes sense. Um, and I think that, so that's on the social justice statistics part. I think the conversation about office department agency is a whole nother uh, conversation. Is your hand back up? Yes, my hand okay. is back up. I, yeah, I agree with you that we need to make sure that there's like clear what what it is that we're you know talking about race and like very specifically race around this initiation. Um, and for those of us who don't work in government and maybe at another time, but what is the difference between office agency department? I would like to be clued in. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I think this is sort of one of the same. Evan, an answer. It's like Richie's reading, wish he's reading my mind because I, I, in in my mind, what the uh, you know what this is called an office department bureau, whatever it is, I think could depend a little bit on where its home becomes because um, you know it, that might influence things. For for example. You know, if this were to become part of, and I don't want to jump the gun, but you know, if this were to be elevated within the agency of administration, like I suggested, then it would probably be a department of co-equal ranking with the other departments. You know, if it was going to be a freestanding entity that's not tied to um, another another agency, then you know, it could be an office, it could be a board, it could you could kind of make up whatever you wanted to make up, really, depending upon the the governing structure. But um, I, I think to at least to some degree, whether it's department of, office of, bureau of, or any other sort of word of that nature, might be influenced by where it ends up being housed. Does anyone else want to weigh in on that right now? My, my sort of stu simple, stupid thinking of it is, is departments fall within an agency. <laughs> is that right? You think, I mean, there's, there's a hierarchy, right? Offices yeah. are often the standalone highest level, right? Office of the Attorney General, um, Office of the Defender General, all separate entities. Um, agency of the administration has individual departments within. We're, um, is that everything? But like you said, Evan, there's always sort of this exception, like there's boards, boards and and councils and commissions, you know. But I don't, I don't yeah. think we're, I don't think we're going to go into that territory, ho ho hopefully. But I guess you know, you never well, know. I mean, 
Yeah. It, it depends. I mean, I, right. I got to be honest. I mean, drafting, putting together the draft that I circulated last time, I was very much informed by the structure and functioning, uh, both good and bad, of my former employer, which was the Natural Resources Board, right? Which was effectively an office. Sorry, that was my dog. You know, it was an office really run by one person, a board chair. But there was board members that acted in an advisory capacity, very similar to, you know, this sort of advisory board that we were talking about last time. So that entity was named after the advisory group that was basically run by the chair of the group. But yeah, I mean, in my mind, it's usually like agency department office in that sort of tiered hierarchy with notable exceptions like the one that Re ones Rebecca just mentioned, the Office of the Attorney General's and the Defender General's office. But interestingly, those are both offices that are run by a singular person with no sort of advisory panel. So that might be, that decision to call it that might also have historical roots in how it's structured and governed. Susanna? Yeah, I just wanted to agree generally with what Evan had said before about um, how what we call it will likely depend on where it ends up. And also to follow up on this discussion in Witchie's question about what is the difference between all of those terms. And it's interesting because um, generally speak, I mean, you do the same thing with job titles, right? Are you a coordinator or a director? I can't tell you how many jobs I've had that I was the director and I was the only staffer, right? So it has to mean something too, right? It has to matter. And I think about the agent, even within the executive agencies, for example, um, the IT department is called its own agency and it has its own secretary, even though that work falls under Secretary Young in the agency of administration, or we have a department of public safety, which arguably does enough of a heavy lift that it does agency work, it's called a department or like public service. So there are times where um, we break the trend and it feels odd. And so as we think about citing this, I would just encourage us as much as possible um, to come up with a name that not only um, reflects the importance of the work, but also that we don't fall into a pitfall. Like, for example, um, you know, if you call something a coordinator role, it's a certain pay grade, right? So I would just want us to, to be cautious about that. You know, um, what you said about having to mean something, uh, Susanna, is, is is maybe that is the starting point for us with this discussion is just sort of a reminder of what we at least have found common ground on, right? Common ground being independence. Um, we've submitted reports on this, stressing this point, independence to ensure that um, people can tr trust the information, right? Uh, and independent in terms of not feeling like it is a political tool of any particular um, agency, uh, any particular event, any particular um, uh, polit politician, right? So independence was one I remember. The other thing that's emerged with our discussions this summer has been a concern that there be stability, that there be uh, stability both in the sense that there is some kind of scalability, right, that it can grow and be flexible and nimble enough, uh, stability, and stability in terms of funding I've heard us talk about, right? And so th that has been a driving force in terms of thinking about, do we want to put this or embed this within a well-established uh, state entity? Or are there, or is, and is, is, it, is, it, uh, say, is it safe to presume that it is more vulnerable to having funding cut if it was a standalone new entity? Um, is that fair? Is that, do, I, do others want to share? Is that what we are, what are common ground? Are we missing other things? Um, so we have a lot of people who are pretty experienced in state government and working with the legislature in various levels and seeing how funding works and not works. If I could just comment on the concern about stability and keeping this well funded, because um, that is a concern of, of mine as well, right? And making sure that, that this means something, this has staying power. You know, I was talking with, with Matt 
Valerio before this call, and he kindly reminded me that anything can be chopped, right? Like <laughs> even the most established offices can have their budget slashed in any given year, right? And so that it's almost a false sense of security to think, well, if we embed this within a well-established office agency, that that somehow protects it. So that was key point number one. Um, the other was, um, I think my question to him was just like, what uh, are there such things as multi-year funding grants, right? Um, I just didn't know if they were done, if they were ever done, and if so, how many years can you get going forward? And again, please correct me for everyone else on this call who has who has a lot of time in government work. But again, Matt said, yes, it certainly could happen. You could get. Um, funding requests multi for multi-year projects pass through any given session, but it can also be rescinded the next year, right, if the circumstances change. I don't know if others want to share in terms of their experience with funding and that. I'll agree with Matt. Anything can, anything can be cut. <laughs> Um, and depending, and it all depends also on, you know, the way dif different departments put their budgets together differently. Of course, we've all got to follow the direction from the executive branch if we're in the executive branch and how we do it related to the governor's priorities. And so a lot of times that impacts, you know, what gets funded. And how and how the money gets allocated out to different departments. Is is that true for the Secretary of State's office and the auditor's office? Is it that they have to that in terms of the getting approval from the governor? I mean, is again, I'm trying to sort of explore the extent of independence that these different entities have within the executive branch. I don't know. I know that the, well, I think that the HRC, you know, it is independent uh, and yet its funding is very heavily reliant on whether it is included in the governor's proposed budget. Mm. The same thing was true for the Natural Resources Board where I worked there. Um, you know, it was, they had to submit a budget. Fingers crossed that the governor includes it unedited in his office's budget and that it makes it in there. Um, you know, that was an entity where some of its funding came from independent revenue sources. Um, yeah. Well, actually, that's not entirely true. I think that I'm trying to think how it worked now. I almost want to say that many of the, per the many of the revenue that it was collecting directly, aside from its enforcement costs, actually did go into the general fund. Um, and then it had to try and recoup those through the preparation of its own budget uh, to make the sales pitch that it was self-funding itself, at least in part, or in good part. Um, you know, I also having worked at the Agency of Natural Resources, which is a much larger environmental entity, I can tell you that from my perspective, which may not be 100% accurate, um, it seemed like it was a little bit... Um, a little bit easier for a larger entity to defend its turf um, when it came to budget positions, things of that nature. And it was a little bit more difficult for a smaller, smaller entity to do that. Evan, did you did you find within the agency, you know, because the Department of Corrections and the Department for Children and Families, um, along with you know, four other departments are in the Agency of Human Services. And so within the budget building cycle, you know, our finance directors and commissioner present a budget to the secretary and the chief financial officer for the agency. They review everything first. And even within the agency, depending on circumstances, there can be a lot of pushback or conversation around that internally before it even gets to the governor's office. Yeah, so that's budget and finance. 
Yeah, so I was I was not really I was not really part of the budgeting process when I was at the Agency of Natural Resources, but my understanding of the process is similar to what you just described. So that agency also has uh, several different departments: Fish and Wildlife, Parks and Rec, and uh, Environmental Conservation. And my understanding is they each would prepare their own budgets, submit them for agency approval, and so theoretically, yeah, there could be some trimming down or expansion and. There could be a little tension if one department wants some money and another one wants another one, whereas at the smaller entity, the Natural Resources Board, it was, you know, we had one person that basically did all of our office finance stuff and they put together a budget, got the chair to approve it, and then ultimately the entire board to approve it, which was, a, you know, how much were they reviewing it? That's tough to say, honestly. Um, and then we'd and then at the end of the day though both both sets of budgets would go to the governor's office for review and inclusion in his ultimate proposal to the legislature does anyone happen to know what the secretary of state and the auditor's office has to do in terms of budget uh, approvals in terms of it's whether it, it's false or in a similar process to what evan just described I, 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 do I don't, but I imagine it's I imagine it's fairly similar. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we all kind of get instructions, budget instructions at a certain time during the year to start putting things together. An idea about how much money is available, whether or not we need to cut, whether or not we can, you know, what sort of what's happening in terms of the finances. Um, and, and those instructions all come out from well it's finance and management right so they sort of manage the process elizabeth hey give your hand up I yes i do i don't have a solution or an answer to that question rebecca but i have a, another concern that's related to to unfortunately bring up i'm concerned about um the entity's data being utilized against itself um, for funding. If at some point down the road, the entity, you know, reports something that shows that, you know, we're trending down in disparities or we don't have disparities, et cetera, et cetera, um, it then being utilized as a tactic against itself um, and saying, so we don't need to be tracking this anymore. It no longer exists. The, the problem is solved, which, um, obviously is just not true. We always need to be tracking this for, for as long as um, our systems are um, established. So that's just another concern I have. Yeah. No, that, that is a, that's a, that's a good point. Just thinking short of a constitutional amendment. <laughs> just, it's always a vulnerable thing, right? These like this always, always disappearing um, but yes how to how to insulate it so that it doesn't the, the reporting itself doesn't turn um, which again seems to be that you know re whatever reporting requirements go to the legislature so that the policymakers can make the decision as to what to do or not do with the data and the analysis I mean that can always inform what they'll do to continue to proof of funding but at least it's not Again, I think it's almost underscoring the independence part, right? And from being subordinate to a larger office or agency. Okay, well, maybe this is the point, Evan, that you want to introduce your your materials on this subject. Because isn't this on this set section? Yeah, I mean, some some of these questions are answered in the materials that I prepared and. Um, uh, they were circulated in advance of the meeting. Um, maybe I'll just sort of give like a little preview and then uh, do, does it make sense to share the the bill, Rebecca? Yeah, okay, I'll do that. So yeah. so basically, Julio also since for your benefit since you weren't here last time. So we've had this conversation about these five, five I think it's five questions we're supposed to answer for the legislator's request. And, um, you know, one of those questions is where should this 
where should this be housed? And when that came up at the last meeting, you know, I, I again asked how much consideration had been given in had been given to um, housing this within Susanna's existing office um, because her enabling legislation does two things. One, it um, I want to get the language right. It it directs her to let's see what it says. Uh, do you know do two specific things? Oversee a comprehensive organizational review to identify systemic racism in each of the three branches of state government and uh, inventory systems in place to engender racial disparities. And then the second thing is manage and oversee the statewide collection of race-based data to determine the nature and scope of racial discrimination within all systems of state government. So it seemed to me like part of part of her charge was to was to do this sort of data collection, but on a statewide all branch of government basis. And we're really talking about sort of a subset of that charge, which is to collect race based data within the context of the criminal and juvenile justice systems. So again, just to avoid duplication, I was thinking, well, seems like there's an entity that that's supposed to at least be considering doing this. So does it make sense to house this bureau or office, whatever it ends up being called there, um, with whatever resources that office needs in order to get the job done? So um, for discussion purposes, I volunteered to put together something in writing that would um, illustrate how that change would look. The easiest way I could conceptualize it in my mind was just to draft the legislation. So that's that's what I did. And then I also put together a memo that sort of explained what I was trying to accomplish. Um, and, and so the way in which I did it is to um, elevate Susanna's office into a governmental department within the agency of administration. And the reason why I chose the agency of administration, um, it, it's not that I like that agency better than any other. It, it's just that Susanna's office already has a connection with the agency of administration. By statute, it's housed within the agency of administration uh, with administrative, legal, and technical support from that agency um, and general supervision by the governor unless you know it's delegated to the to the secretary of administration. So. That's the first thing I did. And then the second thing was Aton had this idea about having the advisory panel consist of the sort of new makeup of the Criminal Justice Council, which, you know, there's some pros and cons to that, but I included it so that we could all see what it would look like with the notable addition of the Defender General's office, which does not currently have a seat on the Criminal Justice Council. So to effectuate that, the, all of these changes, I had to, um, in this bill, um, amend the enabling legislation for both the Agency of Administration and the Office of Racial Equity Director. And I will pull up my draft and I guess just try and walk through it if I, if I can, if I'm going too fast or too slow, just, um, People can let me know. I'm just make sure I pull up the right one. Okay, I think I think that should be it, and everyone should be looking at the draft bill with some comments on the side. Um, okay, so I tried to use the format that Ledge Council uses. Um, this is just sort of like a big caveat that I put this together for discussion purposes. It's not as though this is a formal proposal coming from the department. State's attorneys haven't voted on this or anything like that. I'm just trying to do something that helps out here. Um, I've tried to note where I'm addressing each of the questions that RDAP is supposed to answer. And I'll flag that this draft doesn't answer all of them because I, I don't think that all of them need to be addressed in legislation. Um, so I'm attempting to answer question one, where it should be located, which is the agency of administration. Um, 
I'm I'm not sure whether question two related to staffing is something that would need to be answered in the legislation or if that would just be answered through the sort of budget and uh, position number process that this new entity would have to navigate on its own. Um, I've tried to answer to a certain degree uh, question number three, which is what is this entity's mission going to be? But um, I also think that simply because the enabling legislation has to state that at least implicitly. But um, I also think that this entity could come up with its own mission statement if it wanted to. Other agencies and departments have in state government. Uh, Monica, what's what's up? Just a, my little two cents on the positions from my experience. If we have um, a good idea about what positions that we want, it's important for those positions probably to be created and established in the language. Otherwise, it's, it is hard to get new positions in, in my experience. <laughs> Yeah, I've, I've also had to deal with position numbers and yeah. getting creative with them, and it's a it's a pain in the butt, um, you know. And and I I tried to yeah. So I mean I, I I tried to include in in here a little note that I don't really know how how that process works. Maybe someone has some more expertise, and we could finesse it either in this bill or in whatever report we put out if we if we feel pretty strongly about the positions. Um, yeah, so section nine, so question four relates to how this entity is supposed to do that data collection. I thought including something in that might be a little too prescriptive and might confine the entity. So you'll see later on that what I try to do is just require that they create rules that govern how they're going to do this. That way they have the flexibility to be a little self directing. Um, they can answer the question because they're going to be the experts while at the same time if it's memorialized in a rule that provides some transparency for the public but it's just a suggestion um and i really did not include any type of answer regarding question five about enforcement authority how it's going to enforce uh this data collection because i don't know the answer to that it just i can't come up with a good proposal so um that's a question maybe for the full RDAP group. Um, all right, so I'm just going to go through it. So the first section that I amended is just the Agency of Administration's enabling legislation uh, because of the existing connection between the Office of Racial Equity and the Agency of Administration. And so the purpose here is just to add that there is a Department of Racial Equity. It, it could be called something else. Um, but it would be a you know one of it'd be the seventh department now within the agency of administration. Um, advisory capacity, yeah. So, right, okay. So, what I tried to do here is bolster some of the independence um, because. This indicates that some of these, some components of the agency administration are really advisory. And I know that we had had this idea that there would be some type of governing body for what would, what would be the Department of Racial Equity. And the Office of Racial Equity already has like an advisory panel, but I, I didn't want that. I wanted to distinguish that panel from the other types of boards and committees that are already existing within the agency of administration and make it clear that, try and make it clear anyway, that that panel really is connected with the Department of Racial Equity and it's the Commissioner of Racial Equity that would be responsible for executing all of their recommendations. Um, and then elsewhere, I tried to build in a little independence for the department. That way, it's really the advisory panel is making these recommendations to the Commissioner of Racial Equity, and that Commissioner of Racial Equity is running that department, and it's going to have some independence. So that was the goal of, of this change. Uh, let's see, what is this one? All right. Oh, OK. Yeah, this was an interesting one. I didn't even know that this thing existed, the Employee Misclassification Task Force. 
Uh, it's within the agency of administration's enabling legislation, but it's overseen by the Office of the Attorney General, which is kind of interesting. And it occurred to me thinking about it that um, theoretically there could be racial disparities in employee classification. So I said, well, if we're if we're monkeying with the agency of administration's enabling legislation, let's just go ahead and be presumptuous and put the commissioner of racial equity or designee on there, and maybe they could spot some disparities in this classification problem. But that's not technically part of our charge. I just thought it was another change that made sense if we're going to be messing with this part of the statutes. Um, OK, so the only point so this this talks about how uh, the secretary of the agency of administration is appointed and then the commissioner of each department is appointed. Now, when I got here, there was a couple of different things we could have done because the agency of administration is in one part of the Vermont statutes and the office of racial equity is in another. So we could have just struck everything in the office of racial equity and moved it all into the part of the statutes that deal with the agency of administration, just like some of the other departments are treated. That seemed a little bit redundant and like more work than needed to be done. So I just said, let's just leave it and then make the cross references when we have to, um, because there's already a process in place for appointing the racial equity director. This, the, the sole purpose of this amendment is to specify that, hey, the appointment of the commissioner of racial equity is addressed elsewhere in statute. Go read that statute. Julio, I see you have your hand raised. Uh, I, I think you may have moved past the point, uh, but I'll just briefly s explain to the lay curiosity. The classification task force has to do with classification of whether someone is an employee or an independent contractor. Ah, uh, OK. I wasn't sure if it was like someone trying to say they should be classified as a different type of employer, a different position, yeah. or a different step within state government. Got it. It's a, it's, it, it, it relates to concerns about wage theft by employers who misclassify workers as independent contractors and thus deprive them of either minimum wage or overtime. Got it. Thanks. Thanks for that. That's, that helps sure. me at least. Okay. And if, before you, you, you leave the point on the appointment and term and the sites to the two sections under Title III. I just I just took a look at one of them, the 2251s, so it gives a sense, because it, it gives a sense of what that one is. And I understand 2251 is saying the appointment of the commissioner of racial equity would be the secretary of the of, of administration. Yes, exactly. Do you know what does 504? What 5005? Yeah, I think we can jump there. So 5005 is the existing statute that deals with the appointment of the racial equity director. And, that, um, and let's see, I can scroll down there and get there just a couple pages away here. That way everyone can look at it. Uh, racial. Uh, okay, so it's the governor makes the appointment. Uh, to the commissioner, to the uh, as the executive director, um, from a list of qualified candidates submitted by the racial equity advisory panel. So it's really like, who do we want to be doing the appointing, and and the reviewing? Um, I'm sure there's pros and cons to both approaches. I just wanted to make it clear that the way that current commissioners within the sec the agency of administration are appointed differs from the way that Suzanne is currently appointed. So there should probably at some point be a discussion about which is the better way to do it if there is a better way to do it. I see Mark says by design. Um, and I don't well, know that we have to make a decision now, but it was I didn't I didn't want to not point that out and then have it come as a surprise later. Well, under both both um, appointment schemes, they would be reporting to the governor. I mean, that's the very essence of being within the agency of administration, right? Well, there's sort of well, there's a di I guess there's a difference between being appointed by the governor and having your the execution of your daily job functions be supervised by the governor. 
So we're going to want to have to make we might want to have to make a distinction there. I mean, another point of conversation is just, um, you know, what are what you know when should this person be removed, right? I mean, and and I didn't try and address that question, but you know, for example, the chair of the Natural Resources Board can be removed like whenever, all of the other, you know, for no reason or any reason. Uh, that's not discriminatory, I suppose. And the other board members, though, have a set term and removing them is a little bit more difficult. So we might want to have that conversation as as well. Susanna, is this the point where where it makes sense for you if you remember offhand? You had mentioned that when this legislation was still in draft form, there was a different appointment or accountability design. And, and I, I see the chat there, maybe. Yeah, um, yeah and, and I think Mark can probably speak to this because he was uh, involved in those conversations. I wasn't, I, I got all my information from people who were brave enough to tell me about it afterwards. But my understanding is that um, originally the advocates who were calling for this had wanted the office to be independent and, um, and the and in the original draft bill, I think the governor did not have higher and fire abilities. That was why he originally vetoed it because um, it was um, interpreted by the executive's council to be an, an infringement of his higher and fire abilities. And so the executive order that he then drafted mirrored the bill almost identically, except for that point. And then the new legislation that ended up being passed mirrored that EO. So technically this bill and the EO are both concurrently in effect. Yeah, and so these two provisions here really only deal with appointment, which I do want to like appointment is different than the sort of oversight issue. And so with so Susanna right now, it's the panel makes a recommendation, the governor appoints um, for existing commissioners within the agency of administration, it's the secretary with the approval of the governor and consent of the Senate makes the appointment. It doesn't seem as though consent of the Senate is necessary right now for Susanna's position. So, you know, there's, there's certainly some similarities. The governor is going to be involved, but the process is a little bit different. So it's just something to keep in mind as people think about this. Um, Let's see, what was this next section? Ah, okay, so this was this was one way in which I tried to give the department a little bit of independence from the agency of administration, even though it would be within the agency of administration. So this statutory section talks about what each commissioner of a department may do with the approval of the secretary. All of you know what I wanted to make clear, though, is that if this Department of Racial Equity comes into existence, it doesn't need secretary approval to adopt rules and procedures for the internal administration for its own internal administration. Um, that way, you know, when it comes time to promulgate those rules about how we're going to do data collection, when we're going to release it, who we're going to release it to, um, those don't need to get run by the secretary of administration first under this proposal it would be the department commissioner would be able to do that um this is just um this is this is probably a little bit redundant but every other department within the agency of administration has like a little a very very tiny statutory section that just establishes its existence so that's what this does but it it with a with a with a citation to all of the other statutory provisions that deal with the uh, Department of Racial Equity. Um, but then, I mean, like I was saying, another option could be just to strike the existing enabling legislation and draft new enabling legislation within the same chapter of the agency of administration. Maybe it's, you know, tomato, tomato, but there's just two different ways to do it. Um, and then at this point here in section seven, this is actually when we get away from the agency of administration's enabling legislation and we get into Susanna's existing enabling legislation. So some of this is just um, just changing the words to make it make sense. So for example, instead of having a position of executive director, we've got an agency. Um, 
you know, and just clarifying that it's supposed to work within all branches, like even the legislature potentially, like there could be some disparities that exist there. I don't know how much thought they've given to that, but uh, it, it could exist. And this this uh, department would have the authority to investigate that. Um, oh, yeah, this is the same thing. It's just um, it's just clarifying that it's not restricted to the executive branch of government where these problems might exist and should be resolved, that it might also exist in the legislature and the judiciary, and this entity should have the authority to track that down and change it if possible. Um, now, this this was this this was my attempt, but it, it mirrors to a certain degree um, the existing language. But this was an attempt to again reiterate that the expectation is to have some independence. So the agency of administration is there to provide the sort of logistical support, administrative, legal, and technical. But aside from that, this entity is supposed to act independently. Um, and neither the governor's office nor the agency of administration should be preventing the department from executing its powers and duties. Um, and then this just changes it. Oh, oh yeah. So this is really just for consistency sake. So in other sections of the agency of administration's enabling legislation, they talk about things like advisory committees. They don't use the word panel. So this was just me trying to be consistent. It doesn't mean that the panel has a bad name for it. I was just striving for consistency. Um, this next section, I, this is where I was trying to follow Aton's suggestion of seeing if the new makeup of the Criminal Justice Council would be a good makeup for this advisory panel. I'm not entirely sure. It results in a very long list of members and you know, a lot of cooks in the kitchen. But so what I tried to do was not really edit that suggestion, just do a straight merge. So it's going to be it would be the um, the ex the existing members. I, maybe I forgot to change five here. That number it'd be the exist. I tried to mesh basically the panel, the existing panel structure, the current makeup of the Criminal Justice Council, and then add a seat for the Defender General's office. So it's a big long list. Um, but, you know, that, that was the suggestion. So I included it so that everybody could, could see it. This is where I added the Defender General's office. Um, so. We could go through them if th th this, this is in, even in the Criminal Justice Council as well. So I left that, um. And this, I just, this was, they wanted staggered terms on the panel. It seemed irrelevant now that they're already appointed and that the makeup of the panel was going to get much bigger. So I just struck it. But uh, rather than trying to stagger the terms of 12 or 15 people, which I see that your hand's up. Yeah, I have several questions. Um... And I'm sorry if you, if maybe it's because it, you, maybe you're gonna be repeating yourself, but just want some clarifications. So first being, um, like how does this sort of relate to the bigger picture of what we're tasked with, of like, um, helping create this Bureau of Racial Justice Statistics or whatever its name is going to be. And the second question is, um, this that uh. Committee or advisory committee looks a lot like the racial equity task force, um, and how then would that differ from that? Yeah, yeah, those are both good questions. So, what so what was interesting is so in the in the legislation uh, Act sixty five when it charged us to answer these questions, another thing that it asked us to do was to come up with draft legislation. Um, and I suspect that the reason why is because. Um, if this entity is going to exist in the state government, it needs to be created and authorized through legislative enactment. So the General Assembly needs to promulgate what's called enabling legislation that creates this thing and defines the scope of its authority. Um, and then the entity can be given additional powers to promulgate procedures, rules, all of that kind of stuff to fill in the gaps in that enabling legislation. 
So uh, we'll get there in a minute, but you'll see this legislation doesn't say, for example, the Bureau should follow these protocols or these best practices when it collects data. Instead, it says, Bureau, you're going to be the expert on this. You come up with rules that explain how you're going to do that. Um, so that so so the way in which this addresses, you know, the creation of the entity is if this bill were to pass, the entity would come into existence like that. It would just happen um, in turn. Well, with an appropriation in terms of this committee. Um, the committee, we had had conversations about having some type of, I don't remember what we were referring to it as, but some type of governing body or advisory panel or something that would be the entity that would advise the, the uh, you know, whoever was running the bureau on what questions it should be asking and where it should be exploring disparities. Um, what I realized was that Susanna's office already has this thing called the Racial Equity Advisory Panel. So if Susanna's office is going to house the Bureau, the question then becomes, can that existing panel act as that body that's going to direct the research questions that are being asked? And if the answer to that is yes, and if Aton's suggestion to make the composition of that panel look more like the Criminal Justice Council is adopted, then this statutory section would need to be changed in order to make that happen. Yes, no. Susanna. Oh, sorry. No, I can wait. Would you go ahead? Yeah, I just have a follow up to that because I don't. I guess I'm missing a connection point here because this bill reads to me that this is to sort of reorganize uh, the Office of Racial Equity for it to be under the agency of administration. Are you saying that this is sort of that stepping stone in order to then create the Bureau under the Department of, of Racial Justice and doing the department allows for more authority to be able to be given to this Bureau? Uh, yeah, I'm yeah, pretty, lost. pretty, yeah, pretty much, pretty much, except that, you know, it, and so, yeah, pretty much. It's, that's really close because so Susanna's because Susanna's office already has a statutory obligation to coordinate data, data collection on racial disparities. And because um, it's supposed to be addressing systemic racism across state government. The idea was, well, do we need that office and another bureau that's going to be doing some of the same stuff, but with a specific focus towards the criminal and juvenile justice systems? Or should Susanna's office just be given the people, the money and the tools needed to do that job as well? Um, and if and if the decision is, yeah, let's just beef up Susanna's office and, and, and give it what it needs to get this job done then you know there would be two options just leave it as that as the the charge for her office or one of the charges for her office and give her the staff to do it or theoretically although i think this might be a lot of bureaucracy you could do that and then create within her department an office or a bureau to do this um, and add another layer to it i did not decide to add that other layer to it i just said you know, let, uh, you know, just let her, let her beef up her office, elevate it to a department, make her a commissioner and, um, and let them run with this. Susanna. Yeah, I would, I should have said this a long time ago, but, um, as much as possible, I am going to encourage us to talk about this, not using terms like she, her and Susanna, um, because, who knows, maybe I'm not the right guy for it, but that shouldn't taint our view of the proposal itself. So you can talk about me like I'm not here. I won't be upset. Thank Got you. it. So, um, Richie, did you, did you have other questions you wanted to ask Evan? Because I also had a bunch of things I wanted to say. Great. Um, I, I have other questions, but I think you should go and I'll just see if mine don't get answered. Okay. So, 
thanks, Evan, for, for um, doing this, because this is the critical next stage that we need to get to, which is proposed and draft legislation, no matter what. I think I, I've made this point before, but I'll make it again. Um, in terms of modeling any of the membership of the governing board or advisory body on the um, council criminal justice training, um, and I'm probably got the name wrong, <laughs> uh, is really uh, problematic from um, a perspective of representing people who are in these criminal court systems. It's already a slanted, unbalanced um, makeup body. As you can see, even before you added all the all the Defender General's office, thank you, Evan, for at least including that. I, is, try, I tried to do what I could. It is very law enforcement heavy, right? And not community um, centric, not not lived experience centric. I think if you were to sort of map out where we could expect predicted lines to fall, I think that you know, however we want to think about and check what is balanced, what we mean by balanced, is it just right? What, what are we? What do we mean? Maybe we're not on the same page as that, right? Um, and from from my perspective, this is not balanced because it is law enforcement heavy, public safety focused heavy, right? And and so that's sort of a general um, response in terms of looking to that legislation for, for example, if I start at the beginning of your draft. Yeah, um, just tell me where you want me to scroll up and, there was and some while I'm... I'll say I, I don't necessarily disagree with you on that point, Rebecca. I mean, I, I really think that the makeup of the, the council serves a different function than this entity. I just didn't want to like not include this suggestion because it was made. Um, sure. But I, I agree that there could be concerns with following that model strictly. I, um, I just got the toolkit from AISP in terms of who to who should you identify to be part of the decision making body was an inter interesting exercise and certainly informs um, my look. You know, Julia, I realized you may not know what we're talking about. It was a toolkit that we sort of kicked off this summer's discussion on, and I'll send it to you. Um, but in a nutshell, it was how to approach um, sort of designing um, a government body with sort of a racial equities perspective slant and data collection, right? It was a data collection entity specifically with um, a focus on racial equities throughout. All right, so that's one. The second was uh, the discussion about the relationship of that body, however it's made up, to the head of the office, the commissioner, as you reference here. Yeah, let's get to that point, because there was another section, too, I was just about to get to about that. Um... And, and that fundamentally goes to how we see Again, sort of this oversight question we're grappling with, the independence nature, right? I mean, we sort of have been focusing on the entity itself and how independent it is from perhaps the governor or other, you know, law enforcement or other other um, sort of slants. This is a different type of independence that we should think about, which is keeping the commissioner, um, making sure the commissioner doesn't run the show, Right, like, is this body a mere advisory body or is it a governing body? Does the commissioner take direction from the governing body or merely advice, which the commissioner can dismiss? Right. Yeah, that that's a good question. I that's, I, th I I think I have some language in there about that, and I it and it's a it's a it's a good point for discussion. I think I see um, it in section twenty two oh three page two, uh, line five. And this was, let me Okay, because there's this part two yeah. that makes it advisory. The committee shall advise the commissioner on the department's execution of duties assigned to it by basically all of the duties. It advised the commissioner on all of the duties, including but not limited to which questions to answer through the department's collection and analysis of data to determine the existence and scope of any racial, racial disparities within state government. So I read that language as advised, not yeah. direct. Yep. Right. All right. So again, I just want to share with this subcommittee, I think a critical check that we can build in in the design of this some independence, an extra check is to have this be the commissioner 
responsibilities is 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 directed by this body, right? The questions to be answered. Um, you know, I don't know if others agree or disagree, but maybe there was that as a as a general comment. And so yeah. I just. I mean, I think I think my views are somewhat tainted, honestly, by by seeing how the Natural Resources Board works in state government. I mean, it was a board of five individuals, only one of whom was paid anything more than the fifty dollar per diem. And honestly, getting the other four, four board members to have a sufficient base of knowledge to be able to function effectively in managing that entity's uh, mm -hmm. execution of its statutory duties was a chore. Uh, recruiting people, uh, educating people, uh, getting people to engage could be difficult at some times um, given, given the structure. So I would say if if the idea is that this panel is going to be running the show as opposed to advising someone on how to run the show, I think that the number of people that are going to be part of it needs to be evaluated. What these are these are they going to be uh, and are they going to be and what are they going to be compensated for doing this? Because otherwise it, it might be very difficult to get them to be as functioning as, as functional as, as we would like. Karen. Yeah, I think the the conversation you're having right now is really important. And I'm wondering if it would be helpful, one, to put just a reference to the AISP um, toolkit in here somewhere so we don't lose that piece, um, because I think that's really important work that's already been done. And to relook at that and make sure we contemplate what they have suggested. And um, I just think the other conversation is really important. It should be um, brought to the brought to the larger team around advise or direct. OK. Yeah, yeah. Well, the one thing I did do and, and, and I I think there could be a, a way to make them more of a directive body than an advisory body. I just think there's a lot more questions that would have to be answered to make that happen. One thing I did try and do was at least make it clear that this committee would advise the commissioner on all of the department's statutory duties, not having been around when the Office of Racial Equity was first created or the executive director of racial equity was first created. It, I, I was I was it was interesting to me that it seemed as though the existing panel panel's role was limited to only a subset of the department's duties. So I tried to broaden it a little bit, um, not knowing if there was a, like a good reason for limiting it initially. You know, that, that brings me to sort of another overall comment I wanted to share with everyone, which is sort of this tendency to be like, oh, this is a, a great place or opportunity to throw in an extra duty on this commissioner to address racism and in, in, in the system. And I'm sensitive to Susanna's sort of comments throughout, which is the way one person can be like, I mean, the sole job, but but the other, which is that the, the tasks of this statistical center, particularly if it scales up beyond racial equities, to make sure it matters, I feel like we should keep a very, very clean, devoted purpose and sole mandate is just this, right? And and I understand the concerns that I'm hearing, which is you're inviting repetition, overlap, exhaustion of the same players being involved. If, if you don't use this to replace others. And I think my response to that is, is sort of going to Evan's point, which is if we commit to a governing body, we should commit to funding it appropriately and bringing in the appropriate expertise to to compensate so and, and bring in a particular type of skill level. So I don't necessarily think there's quite the overlap in terms of it if we keep it pure, purely on focused on data. Um, and the other is that by keeping it just focused on data collection, aggregation, reporting, analysis, we elevate the whole business itself. Um, and so I, I just, I just wanted, I, and because this is written as if it is just focused on racial equities and not scalable up. And I increasingly see this as an entity dedicated to data aggregation collection review. Julio? 
Yeah, I guess that, I mean, the, the point you raise is a question that I've had because I haven't been part of these discussions, which is whether this is really envisioned as an entity that's designed to collect, analyze, and disseminate data in the same way as, say, the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics does, which it doesn't get involved in either labor enforcement or policy, uh, or the Bureau of Justice Statistics, which just provides different ways to slice data and to look at data for whatever questions are presented to BJS, which doesn't have any connection with enforcement, you know, like grants from the different offices in DOJ or, or enforcement. That's pretty much a technical kind of technocratic function that, you know, does the crunching for whatever, for whoever decides, you know, like what they want to look at and, and then does that assignment. Um, but I, I, that's what, that's what I, when I looked at the draft report, I thought that's what it, what, um, it, it looked like to me, but, um, but it also, there's also part of the mandate that says, you know, that asks the RDAP to define scope of duty. So I guess they, that the legislature wasn't thinking it was ironclad, but, um, yeah, I think that's a good point. Julio. It's sort of like two different points, I think, that you and Rebecca have raised. You know, I think Rebecca, one one point that Rebecca raised is, OK, do we want and this is something we have talked about pre, in previous meetings, like should this entity be restricted to just collecting data that might show disparities based on race or do we want to set it up to do that initially with the understanding that it could be flexible enough to collect data on disparities based on gender, national origin, or any other protected class that um, we might be interested in exploring. So that's sort of the one question. And then the, the second, and I don't think, it, the the task I think to RDAP, and it was really restricted to race. We sort of asked that question on our own, I think. The question that you're asking, um, I think <clears throat> I, I assume that the legislature expected us to answer that a little bit. Um, and, you know, I think that, um, you know, I think one thing that we're going to have to consider at some point is if we establish this entity as a pure data collection entity that stands um, separate and apart from Susanna's uh, or not the office of, uh, of, uh, of uh, the executive director of racial equity, if it stands outside that office, then what do we do with the fact that that office is already supposed to be collecting data related to race across state government? Does that mean then that we need to amend that existing enabling legislation to make it clear that that's no longer its responsibility, that um, it's supposed to collect data regarding race across state government, except for in the criminal and juvenile justice contexts? because um, someone else is already on top of that now. Um, that's sort of like a big lingering question, I think. You know, and then are you really staffing up two different offices to do the same types of data collection, but on a slightly different topic? Um, that's another question I think we'd have to ask. Well, I think the statute says managing and overseeing seeing the statewide collection, um, that that's part of you know, that was in the original um, statute and, um, well, it says collection. It doesn't actually say analysis of the data. Uh, I mean, the, like the very, to me, kind of rubber hits the road, brass tacks, whatever <laughs> image you want to use for this is that someone's going to be asking a state agency to provide data that may not exist in re readily accessible databases. That's going to be voluminous and time consuming and may require substantial resources to de-identify the data that might be protected by state or federal law. Um, and so someone, you know, someone who is, is going to have to navigate that, um, which is different than inputting the data and starting to create models to try to isolate different sources or, you know, test different 
statistical hypotheses about things like student discipline and so forth. So I don't know that there's necessarily a different, uh, you know, like duplication. I'll give you an example, just one thing that I'm familiar with, and I'm not saying this is representative, but it's just something that I am familiar with um, that might be illustrative. The, the Bureau of Justice Statistics um, puts out a national crime victim survey report. Um, the data is actually collected by the U.S. Census Bureau. But the Bureau of Justice Statistics is involved in asking census what questions to ask uh, and uh, for what periods or, and at what level of specificity. Um, but really, the, you know, the ground workers and the statisticians at the Census Bureau are the one who take that order and then go fulfill it um, and then provide um, raw data sets to BJS, which has its own PhD statisticians that start testing different ways to, to report on trends and different sorts of responses to surveys of, uh, of, of people who've reported being victims of crimes. Um, so there is, there, I think there's a, a kind of a separation between ordering the data and then folks who are empowered to do that. Um, and and they're, they're different. I think one chat, and also just to step back a little bit, and again, this is mostly my perspective as a non-participant, but the other meeting that um, I'm not attending right now that I was invited to was the one uh, that State Police, Fair and Impartial Policing Committee has relating to traffic stop data. And I haven't been involved in any of those reports, but I've seen those reports go out in a lot of different states. And part of the challenge or the de debate or divisiveness that can occur in debate about traffic stop reports or reports about, um, in some jurisdictions, use of force, um, is that whoever is doing the study, whether it's a university or whether it's a group like Citizens for American Progress, um, that they began the study with a conclusion already set in their mind, and then they design, and then they design the study, or they, you know, in, in blunt terms, cook the numbers to come out to an outcome. Um, so I think there is some benefit to having at least some unit that is sort of insulated, even within its own mission, from um, having views as part of their job description about policy decisions, but identifying gaps, disparities, trends, um, and not be, not those technicians be involved in the policy formulation. They're sort of serving up the information for people who are tasked with policy to do that. Um, but they're often, you know, they, they can be within the same agency. They just have to be sort of firm, firmly uh, firmly separated by, in a, you know, by, by mission so that it protects those employees um, that they, they understand in their role. Um, so there is some benefit to having at least some level of specificity about the people who are going to do the data analysis, maybe. Karen? Yeah, I'm, I'm hoping part of what I'm hearing, and I hope I'm hearing it, I hope I'm understanding what um, Julio was saying, is that there's the, and, and I just want to actually update him a little bit on what we've done in the past, is this governing, governing body for the policy issues, which is one of the things I was heard him, I heard him talking about. And then this whole idea of the mechanics of getting the data and making sure it's the right data and knowing how to access the data and get the data to a place where someone can de-identify the data and um, serve it up to those folks who are going to be analyzing it. And we have had some of those conversations, Julio, about those being two different bodies. So there's the policy body, which is a really important set of people to help 
define the parameters of what's going to be studied and come up with the research questions. And then there's this, what I like to call the nuts and bolts committee, because it's a really technical committee that has to work with, um, we've talked about the the execs in the departments who are going to be supplying the data so that they, they can give the authority for people to hand the data over, whatever's available, um, and easy to access to start with. So start small and build up. And then also the IT folks in those departments, because they're the people that know how to get the data out of the systems. And then working with ADS, because they're going to be the ones that are going to know how to de-identify the data. And that's where a lot of the executive branch data has to go through anyways. They have certain parameters and guidelines and rules and regulations and the privacy and confidentiality and security regs that they have to deal with. And so we've talked about having a separate body, and we were calling it a governing body too, but it's, it's a body, we call it the infrastructure governing body. Um, to actually be the folks that work on the nuts and bolts. We had um, Mo West from Search, who is the national data sharing entity for criminal justice data, come and talk to the group early on and talk about his experiences in other states, creating these bodies and creating the infrastructure and the data sharing pieces to fit together. So we're waiting to hear because we're working with another group um, called NCJRP, the National Criminal Justice Reform Project, who has some funding to engage ADS in hiring a project manager to help coordinate that other body of work to get the data to this policy entity and to the new office of whatever we're going to be calling it, the data analysis office. Um, so we're, we're kind of separating the work out, the policy work and the nuts and bolts work. And we're working on getting that together. We should be hearing, I thought I would hear last week about whether we got the funding for ADS and, and the person would actually work for DPS, but pulling yeah, I, together. I was, I'm sorry. I was really talking about when I talked about navigating information collection a little bit uh, from a little bit different perspective. Okay. That, which, which is simply that, I mean, you do need those IT professionals and everybody period, even when everyone's cooperative, but maybe because uh, I work in the conflict business, I can anticipate that some people will not be as cooperative, uh, notwithstanding yep. they may work for the same governor um, or that they may uh, seek to, I mean, there there are many, many, you know, fields of data that might shed light on disparities that where the, where the information isn't just kept in a in a database where you can run gender and race, but rather it might be embodied in you know narratives where you have names and addresses. And um, it's a point that when when the the enact, the, the initial statute um, uh, came up, it was a question that I raised that I don't think the legislature actually ever answered. Um, and so far, and I don't know that. It, it hasn't come up because the deep the deep dig hasn't really begun yet, uh, at least as far as I know. But like, what if one agency says your records request is too broad and we're not going to do it, or we think federal law prevents us from providing it? I the question I asked back when the original bill was before the legislature was, who's the lawyer for the director? Because yeah. The state agencies <laughs> will want the AG's office to represent them. So who's their lawyer uh, if disputes arise? Ah. And so really, I was talking more about navigating the the shoals of government as opposed to um, all of the technical details. Because I agree with you that those sorts of working groups are are common in other types of data collection and and and, and are a little bit different. Well, you know, I, I'm sorry I didn't get through the rest of that um, walkthrough on the RDAP report um, mm -hmm. because we sort of quickly went into section one. But um, as, as Karen as Karen talked about the nuts and bolts section and 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 focusing on how the how to actually do this rubber hits the road was actually a task question from the legislature pulled out um, in Roman numeral five, page six, 
and 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 in there is sort of our start of it, including the diagram that um, Karen and Monica um, and others have been talking about. Um, and as I, as far as I could see, Evan, that piece of it is not in the proposed legislation you talked about, and you it already. Is not. Yeah, and you already flagged the fact that Julio's last point, which is how are you going to make sure this works? Again, that's Roman numeral yep. six of our report because that's a specific question the legislature tasked us to separately review. And Julio, we haven't gotten there yet. We've, we've very broadly sort of talked about the need to have an enforcement mechanism and to share. Um, and thanks, Evan, for confirming it's not in there. I think we talked about uh, models in current legislation relating to, oh, what is it? Is it traffic stop data? Is it about tied to funding? Um, but there are other concerns and specific suggestions relating to subpoena powers or, or how to make sure agreements, data sharing. I think Monica and Karen have both talked about this and Robin ensuring compliance with right getting individual agencies to just agree to this stuff how to enforce it um so yeah no you're you, we are we're all on the same page we just haven't gotten to that part and you'll see on page seven of that report that it's left blank <laughs> and, and i i absolutely did not attempt to answer that question because i have no idea what the answer might be I imagine that, uh, you know, some, I mean, I hope not, but it's, I agree it's possible some entities that might have to be reporting data might not play nice with others. And that would be unfortunate. And there should be a mechanism for addressing that, but I don't know what it is. I, my sincere hope is that a lot of resistance is going to be generated just by the overwhelming task of trying to figure out how to parse through like your own, like one of the big things I keep thinking about is, is there going to be an expectation for the Department of State's attorneys and sheriffs to report out any data to this entity? Because if so, I have concerns that we don't presently have the ability to do that. So, um, you know, I think that there needs to be an understanding and an expectation that even after this entity is created, this entity and the legislature might have to provide some support to the reporting entities so that they can get geared up to do this reporting and do it reliably and they don't muck it up. So I think there's gonna be an education and a, an assistance component to this entity in addition to just the collect, collecting and analyzing component. So um, I we've avoided also, those questions. We've, we've also approached this concern in a, in a different way. I just wanna remind everybody in terms of you know, our first report, our, our, our report last year identified all of the potential uh, data collection points, the discretionary decisions that are made in the in the criminal and juvenile justice systems, and there were plenty. And then we we prioritized within that group, and that list was still plenty. And um, and at least my informal consults with people who do this stuff for a living, um, and then the AISP toolkit again suggested. First, first goals out the the gate, you know, the, get the low hanging fruit, the stuff that's publicly available, right? The Connecticut folks who talk to us suggest that too. Like, focus on what's available, uh, and and target that to start that slow build. Um, but so that was implicit in terms of our section where we get to discussing the mission and scope and responsibilities of the governing board, um, and that's earlier on. And I, and I haven't, I mean, I haven't quite gotten all the way there yet, but, you know, origin, so in my, what I tried to do was say, okay, the governing board that we've been contemplating will become a new, newly constituted committee, the former panel. The panel used to have a limited set of enumerated duties. I changed it to, and we can, again, the conversation about advisory versus directive, but to encapsulate basically advice on the entirety of the work of the entity. Um, and then there there were some changes to that uh, as well. So the way that the existing enabling legislation is set up is the panel has its its own section that deals with what its duties are, and then the executive director has a different section with the separate duties. So, you know, I have I've made some 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 changes there as well. You know, making it clear that it's not just agencies and departments within the executive branch, but it's all branches of state government, including the judiciary and the general assembly. 
And then they use the word, I mean, I don't know. The combat's probably a fine word, but you know, I wanted to try and work in this concept of really identifying as well, because that seems like one of the major components of the data collection is let's figure out where this problem exists so that we can eradicate it more effectively. Um, and then, you know, I, this was my attempt to provide some room for growth by, by saying it's not just, it doesn't necessarily have to be restricted to race-based data. It could be, um, you know, it could try and leave some room to grow in case we wanted to explore other protected categories. Um, and then, yeah, this was, this was my attempt not being a data collection guy myself and not knowing how this entity should be collecting data, but at the same time recognizing that some transparency might be desirable. Say, this newly constituted department, you are going to adopt rules or procedures in accordance with the Administrative Procedures Act that spells out how you're going to collect this data, how you're going to analyze it, and how you're going to share it. Uh, consistent with Section 504 is, a, is the existing confidentiality provisions related to the Office of the Ex Equity Director. Um, so I just wanted to make sure, you know, we do have to worry about that as well. This is potentially some sensitive data and it. While we want some transparency, we also don't want to unnecessarily invade people's privacy. Um, and then this this is this is where I selfishly tried to guard my own department a little bit because I'm concerned that we're going to get hit with an ask and we're not going to have the ability to fulfill it. So, um, you know, I threw in there that this newly constituted department should provide some technical assistance to the entities that it expects to be receiving data from. Um, maybe that'll hopefully create some buy-in as well. Uh, let's see. These are, these are just minor changes, you know, changing things like director to department. Um, oh, yes. And then, yes, yeah, just this addition, this is just to highlight also that, um, you know, the department's going to have to work with agencies and departments to help it in the data collection process, because I could envision some of them struggling with that. Uh, Julio, did oh. you have step earlier? Was there a question before we get too far away from that? I just wanted to say for um, the topic about like these difficulties in data collection, um, it, it, it really is a theoretical. In 2018, Baltimore spent about a year and a half um, struggling with their, they have an office of independent review of their law enforcement that requested records that are held by the police department. They have subpoena authority under the city authority, but they were also represented by the state solicitor's office which also represents the police department. Um, and uh, the police department went to the same solicitor's office and said, we want the people requesting the data to sign confidentiality agreements, which the independent civilian review entity didn't want to do. So it was kind of two competing agencies, uh, one law firm. Uh, and so it's it took about a year plus for them to work it out, but it created a lot of headache. And so I'm just I'm just saying it's not theoretical um, that the solicitor in that case was, you know, a retired uh, Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals judge. So certainly someone who was very capable, but because they didn't anticipate, you know, those tensions or they had historically not had the tensions until that civilian entity started actually exercising their authority. And then it got, you know, then it got real and they they had a problem right away. So I don't think it's I don't think it's theoretical and um, uh, cause it questions of not just burden, but I also think um, again, confidentiality, whether they can because who knows what the data requests are going to be. That's up to the imagination of those experts. And um, so I think it's not just a lawyer question, but also like a leadership question about making decisions about 
you know, when not to, when not to fight it out in court or how to work those things out. Um, so well, thanks for my point was that it's not theoretical. No, no, and, and subpoena, right subpoena authority that. doesn't subpoenas are not self-enforcing. You can just write a letter and then object to the subpoena and then you have to go to court to enforce it. Julio, it's been so, you know, so many of our previous meetings have have explored your concerns. Um, and and in fact, not just on that issue, but any any okay. subpart of the Roman numerals we've been asked to provide. It has been <laughs> appointment. Okay. A huge not to not to dismiss what you're saying in fact what i was going to what because i know you're, you're not falling on deaf ears we are all in agreement in terms of the enormity of, of the of the challenges the question to you because i love that you are able to point to all these actual examples of problems do you have proposals solutions anything to add to this then given your insight and experience because that's that is um anything we can do well, I mean, what happened in Baltimore was that the way it was resolved was that the city council increased the budget for the entity so that they could hire hire private counsel. Well, you know, I was just going to talk about that because I think one of the things that is, I hope, doesn't become too problematic is the fiscal analysis of this proposal. You know, how many entities are going to be expected to report data that are going to need an appropriation? so that they can update and or replace any software that they're using so that they can keep track of this data in the in the in you know in the event that they get one of these requests uh, i mean how many entities are we talking about that may need to do that kind of thing and what what's the dollar figures that that, that would entail um, so i actually That's had forgotten about this one change that i made which kind of gets to this cuz I was thinking to myself, okay, well, we have this whole panel, and what if they advise the uh, department on something, and the department says, well, thank you very much, but I don't really, you know, I'm not going to pay attention to that piece of advice, right? So it sort of gets to Rebecca's point about advising versus directing. And so, you know, what I, um, you know, I added, I added something here where in the, the reporting requirement that currently exists for the, um, for the, director of racial equity um, to add in that, you know, when you issue these reports, you need to explain how it is that your department considered advice provided by the committee. That way, it's at least hopefully tr more transparent when they did or did not follow the advice and why. And then policymakers, including the legislature, can decide if, you know, they need to make some tweaks as a result of that. Um, this is mostly just, a, I just relocated this, but it's, you know, the the annual report contents of, of what the duties are. Um, yeah, and then this is, this, is the, this is the existing provision regarding confidentiality. I only updated the terminology, but I, I didn't really change, I didn't really change it. Um, so it, it is what it is uh, right now, and I know that, we're going to have to deal with confidentiality and things like de-identification. I don't have the answers to those, so I just included this as a placeholder where the terminology has changed with the expectation that we're going to have to review that at some point. Um, and then uh, we already talked about this a little bit, but this is the last provision just deals with the appointment process. And I tried to already flag, just please keep in mind that uh, it does differ a little bit from the appointment process for other positions within the AG agency of administration, and I think folks just have to decide what they're more comfortable with. Um, that's all I got. Sorry, sorry, it my apologies if it took so long. No, and actually, it, it was a way for us to to get to a lot of these issues that we're trying to do. So it's great, and really, thank you for um for doing all that effort, taking this and. It's one thing to talk the ideas, it's another to actually propose the actual language, right? And this is a good start. Even if it reveals it's a bad idea, right? Then we know, you know? I mean, honestly, I, I, I really just wanted to try and get something for people to look at to move the conversation forward. Um, so. So I think Aitan was hoping we could, well, I don't know. I mean, to, to me, this is a, this is a, a great start. Um, you know, it's way too early to sort of 
say yay or nay, because what you raised were so many sub issues that, as Karen, you suggested, we should really we should take to the panel. In fact, sort of my takeaway from tonight is highlighting a lot of these fundamental questions that were raised tonight that we've been grappling with throughout the past few weeks to sort of we need some decision points uh, by the full panel. There's to the extent there's some agreement. Um, is that is that fair? Is that fair where we're at with this? Um, I I think that that's fair. I I did not envision the working group voting on anything. I I sort of envisioned us coming up with a sort of menu of options or rec possible recommendations for the full RDAP to vote on. And, and honestly, I think that's even potentially true with the RDAP report. I mean, we may have all the answers and we may agree on a path forward, but we might also be providing general recommendations and a menu of options for the legislature to consider. And I, I don't think that's falling down on the ask to us. Um, I, I, I think that would be an acceptable path forward. But, you know, hopefully we come up with a solution to all of this, but I think we should be prepared that that might not be possible. Um, and it might be a, a just outlining a couple of different ways in which this could happen and maybe the pros and cons and let the legislature decide. Yeah, I think a lot of I think there were a lot of pros and cons, I think, for um, what Evan proposed and the alternative of just having it be its own office. Um, and I, I think that the idea of here are different options that we've come up with, here are some benefits and drawbacks to each of them. I think we should come up with that draft and present it uh, to the bigger RDAP group. Because I think maybe at this point we would just keep going around in a circle amongst ourselves. Yeah, I agree. Tomorrow is the meeting, right? <laughs> is that and, and then the next month is October. Um, should our suggestion be? I mean, it does feel like we could identify some of these points, but perhaps we have more agreement than not on some of the others. I don't know. Do, Elizabeth, you, you, do you have something to, to share? You look like you're about now. No, I had just, just eating before, so I had my camera off. That's all. <laughs> but thank you, though. And I, I already gave a heads up um, but I'll, to Atom, but I'll, I'll flag it for the folks on this group. I actually, I actually can't make it tomorrow night. Um, my apologies for that. Um, I, I'm just not able to do it tomorrow. Well, so perhaps like the, it makes sense like tomorrow like Gaetan's agenda is to to just sort of have us go around and, and speak about what where we what has been happening and um, maybe that's our point that we'll come back aim for October's monthly with our list of specific asks after we've had another well not that many more but I guess four more weeks three more weeks to sort of work through this list together of agreement not agreement panel. Let us know what you think. Yeah. Okay. Um, good. Does anyone else have anything? Oh, Ian. Uh, yeah, just uh, for the for the benefit of uh, uh, Aton, who I'm going to discuss this with afterwards. Um, for action items, do we mostly then just have? Uh, discussing various questions with the larger RDAP group tomorrow. Does, is anybody else going to, is anybody going to be revising uh, uh, draft documentation or anything? I am not. Um, my, my understanding is that we were going to come up with a list of, of questions to ask for the panel for next month. But tomorrow, perhaps we could all, Evan, you could walk through and explain what you've been sharing with us. Um, Karen or Monica, you know, can talk about the, the nuts and bolts plan. Uh, you know, everyone can chime in in terms of where they want to sort of share with the group where we are now without, I don't think, it sounds like we're too early to ask the panel to vote on anything for tomorrow. Is that right? 
Ian, does that help you for your action points for Aton? You're there. All right, you're not there. Well, let us know if you if you if you or you can tell Aton. Sorry, I I'm used to Zoom. The uh, keyboard shortcuts are different. Um, yes, that that does help. Thank you so much. All right, all right, guys. Anything else we should talk about? We'll see you tomorrow night. <laughs> all right. Thank you. Thanks, Rebecca. Have a good night, everyone. Bye. Good night, everybody.